Chapter 1. When I pulled up to Brian's last stop service station, the tall man in the office jumped a foot and jerked away from the cash register. That told me plenty, and so did this business of looking relieved when I poured myself from behind the wheel. I guess you're Mr. Brian, I said. I'm Danny Gumbo. The agency in St. Augustine sent me out. He wiped some imaginary grease on his clean overalls and poked out a nice white hand. Yes, I'm Charles Brian, he said a little nervously. That was probably a plain lie. He acted like a man expecting to be tapped on the shoulder. He had a long face and sunken eyes and a thin nose. An educated fellow, I'd say, maybe a professional man but certainly not a grease monkey. Where does a fellow eat and flop? I asked him. And what's the trouble? Brian pointed to the second floor rooms over the grease rack and washing stall. Up there I don't get to town often but I have plenty of canned provisions. If he sold a hundred bucks worth of gas a week, it was a miracle. The station was moorish with peeling stucco. All that part of Anastasia Island was low sand dunes, rolling over the cement curbs that some real estate genius had put in to bait customers. There weren't more than half a dozen houses, as far as I could see, and they all looked lonesome and haunted. A few hadn't even been finished. There I was, making headquarters at what had started out to be the village center. The last stop service station was shaped like an E with the middle bar missing. One wing, with dirty, broken windows, had been a lunch counter, delicatessen, and grocery, judging from the blistered letters on the glass. The other wing, with arches to let in the salt breeze, was mostly garage space. The biggest laugh was the four gas pumps out in front. What's all this that's threatening you, Mr. Brian? I asked again. He poked his head a little farther forward and squinted toward the highway that runs the whole length of Anastasia Island. His eyes were blue and worried, with veins standing out on the whites. I couldn't decide if he'd been drinking too much or not sleeping enough. He had a weakish sort of mouth that didn't match the rest of his face. A nice fellow with a good voice, only I wouldn't want him on my side in a knock-down and drag-out fight. No, Brian wasn't his name, not by a damn sight. The Bryans are a fighting tribe, like the Gumbos. Well, there's a bearded man hanging around, shooting at me, he said. It would have been silly to ask him if he ever shot back and if not, why not? He just wasn't the type. When and where? I asked. Brian looked helpless. He made a gesture at the sand dunes. I don't know exactly. From all directions. Usually at night. How about the sound? Boy, was he dumb. There isn't any sound. He must use a silencer. That meant the other guy was a businesslike man. Still and all, Brian had been close enough to see that the guy was big and had a beard, and he hadn't got his head shot off. That was funny. The shaggy man was a screwball, or Brian was, or they both were. I didn't ask him why didn't he call the cops. That'd be rotten for my business. How did it all start? I asked when he turned to the glassed-in room where the dusty cash register was and showed me the stairs that led to the second floor. What's in back of it all? Brian fished a butt out of his pocket and got his lighter going. I turned down his offer of a cigarette. Hell, no, I said. Not when I got half a cigar left. While I was waiting for Brian to start talking, I looked out across what decided not to be a town. One of the houses, the nearest, didn't have any broken windows. But that wasn't what caught my eye. It was the flicker of light, as if a mirror, for a second, had caught the sun. I didn't say anything about that, but I was wondering plenty. Can you shoot? Brian finally asked. My answer made his eyes bug out. Before he had even seen my hand move, I had a gun pointing at his stomach. Ever see it done faster? That brag was purely a business matter. He admitted he hadn't. Then he twisted his face into a sour grin, one of the kind with memories behind it. If you handled cards that way, you'd make a million, he said. That was a laugh. Maybe you know that place in St. Augustine, the one with a bric-a-brac front and horseshoe arches with colored tiles. Well, it's a club. They let me in without a card and they let me out without my dough. So I was glad to take this job. A pal at the agency had told me about it. His men were busy with divorces and things like that and they'd turned Brian down. But I needed gas money to San Francisco and before long, I'd have been eating egg stains off my tie. Who lives in that house over there? I still didn't tell him about the flash in the window. A Cuban lady. She hasn't been here long. Oh, you mean she took a powder on account of Havana politics? Exactly, said Brian and frowned plenty. What's wrong with her, halitosis? His grin reminded me of a warm gin fizz. She's my best customer. But the threats didn't start till she moved in. 
I noticed a little round hole in the stand that held the cash register. Reaching for my pocket knife, I began digging. When I got the bullet out, Brian explained in a hurry. That was fired one night when I got through waiting on a customer who came in from the highway. The slug wasn't awfully big, but something about it was funny looking to me. I didn't know just what. This slug might have killed you, I said bluntly. When do I get my advance dough? Right now, Mr. Gumbo. Skip the mister. They call me Honest Gumbo. He looked at me, kind of amused and shrewd. You used to be a policeman, I would wager. Brian meant I didn't look dumb enough to be called. Honest, so I must be a crooked ex-bluecoat. My uncle, the one Brian had used for a namesake, had a face pretty much like mine, only a little rounder and redder, and he didn't carry his liquor so well. The handle I had was a rib, though. They winked when they called me. Honest gumbo. I was on the square but I couldn't prove it. Brian knelt at the floor safe which was flush with the concrete. Anyone trying to steal it would have had to haul away the whole floor slab. I saw what must have been at least a thousand bucks in worn bills. He dug up my down payment and spun the dial to lock the safe. You might as well trust me whole hog or not pay me, I said. Brian gaped like a dead base. What do you mean? He blurted. Buddy, how can I go to bat to protect your business if I don't know the score? All you're supposed to do is find out about that prowler, he mumbled and fidgeted. Do you understand? Oh, all right. I ran my car into the garage. Like I said, that took up most of the left wing of the Moorish Palace. It had a lot of arches, facing into the E and also facing Sunset Beach and the ocean. His car, a six-cylinder job, was standing in the corner. He gave me some overalls which I put on. Then I took my suitcase upstairs. I waited ankle-deep in dust. My room was at the end of the hall that ran in the direction of the drive. The furnishings were dirty and flimsy, and the bath was across the hall. My windows faced sand dunes one way. From the others, inside the E, I got a slanting look at more dunes and the ocean. Through two windows in the opposite wall, I could see the main highway that runs the 18-mile length of the island. Brian pointed up the hall. There's the kitchen, he said. Up at the other end is the living room. On the right are empty rooms. You might take a look around. Opposite the kitchen door was a little cross hall that led to steps going to the rear. There were coquina block walks, half buried in drifted sand, and a little patio enclosed by a wall about waist high. Before I made my inspection, I stood there grinning at my new overalls. Brian caught the point. After all, it's plausible, having you here. Picnic and weekend parties do stop for gas, even if they can't get frankfurters, film, cokes, and so on anymore. No good, I said, shaking my head. I'm buying you out, get it? He nodded. Then I heard an engine below. There's a customer now, he said. It was a last year's convertible. Nile green with chrome trim, not much heavier than my bus, though longer, and about 40 more horsepower. It was made for speed, and so was the woman at the wheel. I hurried down. Fill her up? I asked, polishing the windshield. The red hat bobbed, and so did the black curls. She had a nice smile and nicer eyes, big, dark ones. I couldn't see much more, because she didn't get out, but I knew she'd look good. Where's Mr. Brian? She asked, looking me over. I'm the new pump twister. How about a grease and polish job? I ran the tank over. It needed only three. She laughed, but the joke was on her, after all. Later, maybe, she said. I'll call for it, I told her, and deliver it. Business must be good if Mr. Brian needs a helper. That was a raspberry, but the way her nose crinkled a little with her smile made it nice. I'm buying Brian out, I explained shortly. Oh. That sobered her just a shade. She dug up some bills out of a red and white handbag that matched her dress. Then she waved a sweet little mitt, gave me a heart-stopping smile over her shoulder, and fed that straight eight whirlwind a quarter of gas. The spattering gravel nearly broke a window. She went helling toward the Central Island Highway in a cloud of sand. Brian came out and looked after her with soft, narrowed eyes. When the dust was settling back, he turned to me and smiled weakly. You've met our neighbor, Monica Del Rio, he said. She wasn't too smart, tanking up for three gallons, not after I'd seen that funny flash from her window. But I didn't tell Brian. She hasn't got a Cuban accent, I said. He sniffed. Many of them come to the States for their schooling, those who can afford it. I thought of the gravel kicking up from her wheels. She drove like a Cuban, 
all right, and she had a high-class Spanish complexion, like Jersey cream and magnolia blossoms. That girl might be a lookout for smuggling unsuccessful Cubans in too. She might also be turning a pair of field glasses on Brian's last stop service station. Pretty good name, the last place any customer would stop. Chapter 2. It was getting dark. Brian gargled straight rye while I heated up a can of chili and made coffee on the electric range. The kitchen was in the center of the E, looking toward Monica's house. I was wondering whether she went for honest faces and whether she could cook. When the percolator started bubbling, Brian didn't look so worried anymore. He even began to wipe the whiskey from his chin. The kitchen had quite a bit of first floor canopy reaching out in front of it. The whole building cast a long shadow, which lost itself in the shadows of the dunes and the brush. That didn't mean much, and I didn't bother to wonder why Brian squatted in a corner. I snapped on a light and stirred the chili. Come and get it, I said. The second he got up, a window smashed to bits. I heard a chuckling sound. Something hit the door jam. Down. I hollered, diving for the corner and snapping the wall switch. But Brian had ducked. There hadn't been any blast. The slug I picked out matched the one I had dug out of the office. From where Brian and I had been standing, I couldn't tell whether it was meant for me or for him. Then I felt foolish about not having risked a gander out over the drifted sand. Somebody had plenty of moxie, sniping before it was fairly dark. He's G got a silencer, I T told you, Brian stuttered. Nuts, I snapped. Judging from how the slug went in, it's an air gun. But it'd kill you deader in hell if it hit. They make them powerful these days. It began to look like I'd earned my first 75 bucks. But if I caught the shaggy man, I was fixing to shave him with a tire iron, the one on the desk in the downstairs office. It all smelled as if that Del Rio gal had made a quick report to the gunner. Brian got nicely plastered that night. He needed the relaxation after the few months of what he had gone through. He'd been there about a year and a half, he had told me. Judging from some odds and ends I found in one of the rooms, a woman must have been there. Anyway, murder too with me to look things over, he could let his nerves unkink a bit. My looking was a dead loss the next morning. Whatever footprints had been made in the sand had been blotted out by the wind. There was nothing in sight but the main highway down the center of the island, which varies from half a mile to two miles in width. The station was on a cross road, about halfway between the highway and Sunset Beach. It was lonesome as hell at night and pretty desolate by day. Sometimes, way off, I could see boats landing for beach parties, though most of the swimming was near the St. Augustine end, where a bridge comes from the mainland to the island. That night, I made a prowl among the scattered cottages, looking for the place where the shaggy man camped. I didn't expect to see him, though. He already seemed too foxy. There wasn't any chance of frisking Monica's house, either, because she was staying home. When I came back, Brian was practically sick. He just stood shaking and pointing. There was another busted window and another slug in the window sill. So it's hide and seek, huh? I asked quietly. Shoot that scoundrel, Brian's voice cracked. Buddy, you'll have to wait till I catch him first. The job began to drive me so batty that I greased my car and Brian's and waxed them both. I started sorting out the junk, tools, old hose, lawn sprinklers, battered coffee urns, and the rest of the stuff that was stacked in the storeroom and in the wash stall. The garage floor was an inch deep in crankcase drippings and grease. If things got tense enough, I'd probably clean up even that mess. But to restore Brian's confidence, I had to spend some time tossing chili cans in the air and popping them with my double action point three eight. When I got kicked off the force and they called me Honest Gumbo, with a wink, I threw all my medals in the sewer but a guy doesn't forget how to shoot. Monica came over to have her tires checked. It's so lovely today, I think I'll go out to Summer Haven, she chattered, powdering her nose and eyeing me over the rim of her compact mirror. I love the solitude out there. Yeah, it's nice down there, but I don't like that toll bridge at Matanzas, I chipped in, referring to the one at the south end of the island. I was thinking. Nuts, madam. Do I look sappy? It was just as well I didn't frisk her house. She came back too quick, just like I'd had a hunch she would. She waved at me from the green convertible. That afternoon, a V8 pulled in from the highway. It had enough horns for two jobs that size, so I charged from the patio in the back and made a dive for the windshield. Where's Brian? The sandy-haired guy at the wheel snapped at me like he owned the place. He wore tweeds and had a horse face. Do you want gas or don't you? I asked suspiciously. The other guy was dark and roundish-faced, smooth and good-looking with a little black mustache and an expensive green tie that went just right with his brown suit. I was willing to bet his socks matched his tie. 
they were both slick customers. They smelled of hair tonic, shaving lotion, and high-class soap. The dark fellow's coat bulged a bit, and not from bum tailoring. I guess I didn't like him because he reminded me of the boys at the club where I got cleaned out. Listen, you smart hick, the dark man gritted, sliding out of the seat, we want Brian. This is Brian's last stop service station, and we've made a stop. He had long hands. One of them was making absent-minded brushing movements up and down his vest buttons. Easy, Zahn, the horse-faced fellow said and left the wheel. When he passed around the back of the car, I half turned. Then Zahn made a false move. I don't think he wanted to shoot. He just wanted to sap someone. But he got a shock when my gun barrel clipped his knuckles and knocked his colt to the gravel. I didn't want to shoot, either, not just then. You dirty skunk. He hollered. Then he looked at his buddy. All right, Hale how do you like our pal's new mug? 102. Hail or snow, I'll take on both of you rats, I said easily. How about it, greasy puss? Pick up your gat if you want to play. Zahn nursed his bleeding knuckles. Now, take it easy, Hale said. Brian clumped out of the door and stood there, looking sick. Hale poked out his hand. My old pal. Long time no see, Brian. We've been looking for you, Zahn said. So it's come to this. He pointed at me. I still had my gun out, ready for action. Then it was Kathleen, after all, Brian muttered, sort of dazed. Kathleen, all right, Hale answered, chuckling as sympathetically as a coyote. Sweet kid. You might have known she'd get lonesome out here in the sand dunes. You're awful dumb, Charlie. He chuckled. Is this the way to treat your pals, Charlie? But he backed toward me, and I frisked him. He didn't have a rod. It looked like Zahn was the guy to watch, after all. I picked up Zahn's rod and. Want them herded to town? I asked. When Brian shook his head, Zahn winked at Hale. He's glad to see us. We got messages from home. That's right, Brian admitted glumly. Seeing those two skunks holding him over a barrel, I was all for quitting. When a man won't take your help, how can you do anything for him? All right, Mug, you're fired. Hale took out a silver case and fished for a smoke. Charlie doesn't need you anymore. That was Brian's business, but Hale's crack was strictly mine. I was paid in advance, I said. I'm earning it. I reached and snagged the cigarette case out of his hand. Before he could move, I tossed it up, drew, and drilled it with a slug. Hale and Zahn blinked. Now, if you gents are staying, I'll give you a hand with your baggage, I said. I'm honest gumbo, in case you didn't get the name the first time. The pleasure nearly overwhelms me, Hale grunted. He was sore about his cigarette case, but Zahn just shrugged. He didn't seem to mind my having his gun, and that was something I couldn't understand. After supper, which I fixed up, I mixed a rye and soda and hung around in the living room. It was all glassed in like a sun parlor and it was over the garage section. When I found a blind spot where I couldn't be sniped, I sat down to read and smoke a cigar. I picked on the living room because it was across the hall from Brian's room where the pals were in a huddle. They weren't talking loud, and that was a bad sign. I couldn't hear enough to do me any good, though I gathered it was about money, Tulsa, running out, and debts on the cuff. Once Brian poked his head out. Hale, the horse-faced guy, was right at his back. He gave me a dirty look. That mug don't have to listen, does he? It's handy having him there when I want a bottle or something, Brian explained in a hurry. Have him bring us a couple and get the hell out, Zahn snapped. I took that smiling and got two-fifths out of the case in the kitchen. I shook out three trays of ice cubes. The fourth one jammed, so I had to use the big butcher knife I fished out of the sink. It was a bit rusty, but it felt heavy as a sword. Naturally I stuffed a fifth into my own pocket. When I came back, Hale looked sociable. Get yourself a bottle, too. No hard feelings. Hell, you just did your work this afternoon. I showed him my side coat pocket. I already got one. Zahn grinned. Drink deep but make sure you wake us up early. I guess my face fooled him and Hale. Theirs didn't fool me, though. When I got to my room at the far end of the hall, I took one tiny snort. Before anything happened to Brian, they'd try to cool me first. Blankets are good for more than just to sleep under. I wadded mine up, did some tricks with the table lamp. It was a gag with whiskers on it, but it's the old ones that work. That's why they last long enough to get old. Anyway, I when I got through, anyone from the ground would have sworn it was honest gumbo slumped in a chair, drunk as a fifth of good whiskey will make anyone but a he-man. The huddle down the hall wasn't over when I went out, 
barefooted, after locking my door. For a second, I thought of going down the back stairs to listen under Brian's windows. But everyone was quiet, and those back stairs creaked like a wet fiddle. I wouldn't risk it. Anyway, I had bigger business. This was a double play, you understand. Brian might have a gun of his own stash somewhere, and someone might steal it to do a bit of playing with me. Either I'd nip the shaggy man or else Zahn or Hale. They weren't wild. They didn't have beards, and Brian really had been surprised when he'd seen them. I wasn't even trying to get the score, it was so complicated. The only sure thing was that Brian's two pals wouldn't knock him off until I was buried in the sand dunes. Naturally Brian must be some sort of crook. But he was human, and a nice guy, with maybe just one mistake to his credit. Chapter 3 The grease rack wasn't a comfortable place to squat. The wind and concrete made me plenty unhappy, and I couldn't hear a thing from upstairs. Like I said, Brian's room and the Hale Zahn cell faced the other way. But where I sat, it was easy to watch the angle from where the dummy upstairs was nicely visible. Later, I heard enough to think someone was parking his crullers. Someone else was snoring or muttering. It wasn't long after when I got a hunch that someone was prowling around from the back of the station. The moon wasn't high enough to help, and the wind killed little sounds. The dunes and brush through tricky shadows. I finally caught sight of the fellow, but I couldn't even guess whether it was Zahn, Hale, or the unidentified prowler. Whoever he was, he had a gun, a long-barreled job. Also, he had a fork stick. It's surprising how neat you can make a long-range shot with a revolver if you have a gun rest. The gent with the artillery was across the road now, right where my dummy made a nice target. That was getting personal, so I had to cut in, quick. If the boys upstairs heard the shot and figured I was cooled, there was no telling what had happened to Brian. But a guy can't be everywhere at once. I edged for the gas pump and gained a few yards. Though he had murder in his heart, I still didn't want to pop him off. He was fidgeting around, getting set. I could tell that from the off and on glint of the blued barrel which had worn spots that picked up the light. When I gained another few yards, there wasn't much time left. He was too intent to notice what was happening behind him. Rudd it away. I hollered. Just then, he shot, and a window splattered behind me. But he had heard me sing out. He jumped and cursed, just startled enough to get rattled. I saw the gun shift a bit, but the first flash had exposed his position. He shot at the sound when I moved. That was a mistake, so I let him have it. You can't talk to a guy who thinks he's killed a drunk and then finds out he had an audience. He was still kicking a little when I got to him. The gun was a long-barreled Luger, almost as accurate as a rifle. The guy was Hale. Well, that was a nice start. Zahn would feel different about his business with Brian. So would Monica Del Rio and the shaggy man. Hale, I began to figure, must have had to get stashed in the car. Like a dummy, I hadn't frisked the bus. A fellow sometimes get absent-minded, so I went up to talk to Brian before I forgot something else. When I got back to the second floor, Zahn staggered out of the bathroom and into the hall. Getting so sloppy drunk in such a short time meant that he'd tried to do a week's drinking in an hour or two. Maybe he was celebrating my death. The bleary look he gave me when he stumbled unceremoniously toward Brian's room left me wondering. Brian was long-faced and cold sober. He sat twiddling a glass and staring at the floor. He didn't look up when Zahn came in and he didn't pay any attention to me till I said. I told you I ought to run these mugs in. Hale tried to knock me off. Maybe you heard the shot. Brian dropped his glass. When? He blurted. What shot? With the wind and the way the room faced, a small Borgat might not be noticed. Hale made a mistake, I said. He's out in the sand, not being interviewed. Zahn straightened up. He spoke slowly, a little too carefully, and blinked. But he wasn't crying. So you went and done it, huh? He muttered. Come on and look, I invited. I jerked my thumb toward the hall and herded them ahead of me. He tried to shoot you, and you shot him, Brian was saying. My God. My God. He didn't seem to like violence. I guess that was why he had run out on something and tried to hide from his pals. It was all too cockeyed to be thought out, so I didn't try. I just showed them the dummy in my room and pointed at the hole, halfway up on the window. Glass had fallen inside. Chunks of it lay on the sill because the drawn curtain had kept it from spattering around. He thought it was me, only I was downstairs, and sober. I hollered at him, but he wouldn't listen. So you knew he'd gun you, Zahn whispered. I had a hunch one of you would try. What for? Hell, we weren't sore. You were just doing your job. You didn't know. Okay. Listen, Zahn. 
even if you do find another gad, don't try anything. Look at Hale first, out there in the sand. I turned to the door. Where are you going? Brian asked. I'm phoning the cops. Being a detective, I have two. From what I've seen since I've been here, you probably don't want them around. That's just too bad. But I didn't phone. I'm not an expert lineman, so I couldn't. The black gadget box had been pried off the wall, and broken wires poked out. Someone had picked up the heavy tire iron off the desk and smashed the phone with one blow. The iron was hefty, with a round handle and a long blade. It had been shaped out of the spring leaf of a big car. The guy who used it had laid it back within a couple of inches of the dust marks that showed where it had been. Deliberate, all right. I noted a fresh smudge of grease on the wall near where the phone had been. Probably it came from the guy's hip, in which case he was about as tall as me, Brian, or Zahn. Also, grains of greasy sand lay in the dust on the floor, but I couldn't track the fellow past the crushed rock drive. He must have been squatting in the garage. In that case, he had watched me cool hail. The phone had been okay when I'd come down for that job. Somebody was strictly neutral where Hale and I were concerned. When I went upstairs, Zahn and Brian were in Brian's room. Wise guy, you figured I'd be cooled, I said to Zahn. So you gummed up the phone so Brian couldn't squawk. What do you mean? He demanded. I yanked him out of his chair. He stood blinking, wobbly and groggy. T. Here wasn't any grease smudge on his coat or his pants pocket. Maybe you didn't do it. I said. Hale could have done it, he mumbled stupidly. No go. The buzz box was okay when I went past it. Anyway, you and Brian are material witnesses, and I'm still reporting to the cops. I'm driving to a phone. Zahn didn't care. He shrugged jerkily and stumbled down the hall. What have they got on you? I asked Brian. That's my business, he said almost defiantly. Suit yourself. Here's my guess. You're holding out dough on Zahn and the late Mr. Hale. A girl by the name of Kathleen spilled your hideout. I wish it had been the bearded prowler instead of Hale, he retorted. I'm not a skeet shooter. How much do you want for 75 bucks, Armageddon and the burning of Rome? Do you know that Monica Del Rio has been watching this dump with spy glasses? Brian reared up straight. No. What makes you think so? I saw the reflection of lenses. A couple of minutes later, she came over to buy some gas she didn't need, a stall to look me over and find out what the latest score was. My idea is that she's teamed up with a shaggy man. Do I have to tell myself everything or will you save me some time? Brian just sat there and looked tired. What I had said about the gal was more or less bluff, to open him up. But he wasn't talking. The way things look now, Zahn was too drunk to be dangerous. As long as I was circulating around, he wouldn't have the nerve to cool Brian. Also, Zahn had enough interest in Brian to block any monkey business the shaggy man might pull. But Harry Face couldn't have been a killer, or he'd have taken Brian long before I arrived. Anyhow, that's what I figured, when I headed downstairs to drive for the nearest dog stand or wherever there might be a phone. If I always figured things out right, I'd be a genius and not a cutrate detective. As I left, Brian was doing some tall frowning. He was good at meditation that got nowhere. A fellow gets that way when he's been hiding out a long time. Gambling and some woman, that was how it sized up, hiding out from mugs he owed money and afraid they'd take it out of his hide since it wasn't in his pocket. But he wasn't broke, with that roll. Well, what some people consider being flat would make another guy rich. When they're down to their last hundred grand, they dive out of windows. Then I got a real shock. Monica Del Rio was hoofing it down the drive, all breathless and worried, except for that high-powered smile. She had teeth that were good enough to model for advertising. Her shoes were all dusty, and one of those perfect legs showed through a long runner. But she hadn't been pawed. Nobody had made her get out and walk. Oh, Mr. Gumbo, Madam. Honest Gumbo to you. Where's the long and rakish car? That's why I'm walking. I ran out. Did you know that in England, during the Norman rule, if a person, other than an Englishman, was slain, the people living in the district in which the crime was committed were compelled either to produce the murderer in a hurry, or shell out with a stiff fine. That in France, a judge always wears a black cap when pronouncing the sentence of death, that the dum-dum, or soft-nosed bullet, which expands on striking, was named after the town of dum-dum, in Bengal, India, where it was originally manufactured, that in a court of law, a confession, though admissible as evidence against the person who made it, cannot be admitted as same against his accomplices.
that 50% of the youth doing time in reformatories in this country are mentally deficient, and that the same thing holds true of from 25 to 50% of adult prison population? That the average prison stretch in the U.S. for major crimes, is 10 years. I was slightly over of gas. Would you mind bringing some along? It's not far. It was no use telling her I had urgent business. Also, by being a Boy Scout, I might have a glance in her shack. It's going to be a bit tough. The boss's car is down for a valve grind, and mine's got a bum battery. But I'll walk it. I hate to trouble you. I'll go back myself. I don't mind. That was baloney. She wouldn't listen when I insisted I could find the bus myself. When she agreed to come along, I said. You must have done some heavy driving since this afternoon. She flipped her hand to include the island and the mainland. Oh, all over. I love. If Monica had ever spoken Spanish, I was the Sultan of Sulu. Those Latin languages leave something on your tongue that you can't get rid of. How's things in Cuba? I asked casually. She sighed, looked up at me, and shook her head. Her eyes looked like she was heartbroken. Mr. Brian told you, didn't he? She replied. Yeah, but not half enough. She changed the subject when I said I was homesick for dear old Havana. That proved she was a phony. I'd never been there, either. Chapter 4 Less than a mile away, we found the Nile Green convertible. That was the shortest mile I ever hoofed, and I don't like walking. They must have paved the highway with air or something. Monica hoped we'd get better acquainted when I took over the filling station. So I dumped the fuel in. She leaned over and opened the door. I drive a lot and, naturally, I always head for the wheel. Before I knew it, I was at the controls. Say, can you beat that? I said. Like it was my own bus. I guess I was thinking in that direction. Like it? She smiled. Plenty. And it's in good company, Miss Del Rio. Monica, please. Well that made it cozy. I certainly didn't boot that high-powered bus on the way back. I nosed it into her garage. How about using your phone? I asked. Ours is out of kilter. Don't you have the toughest luck? I liked her laugh. Hearing it was like drinking a case of champagne. Come right in. The bungalow had regular beach cottage furnishings, wicker and this and that, mainly velour upholstered. But everything was as clean as if she had a dozen servants per yard too. Before I got into the living room, I knew there wasn't a shaggy man hanging out there. It wasn't that there were no men's hats on the rack. It just didn't have that messed up look. The only thing out of place was a pair of field glasses on the window seat which faced Brian's last stop service station. I got just one glance, but it was enough. They were 12 powers ice, and the lenses were big enough for night work. Nice place you got here, Val, I said admiringly. Simple, but I love it. I stepped to the phone. Then I learned a few things more, such as why Monica had given me the wheel of her car. She wanted both her hands free, and not to put her arms around me. Her idea was to poke a gat into my ribs. It had been in her pocketbook all the time. Naturally she didn't know I was going to walk right into phone. Never mind that call, she ordered. Just wait and don't move. I guess you'd fire, I said sarcastically but I was bluffing. She meant business. Of course, I would. I'm alone, and you might be a prowler. Nice field glasses you got, I let off, making small talk. Great for watching Cuban ships offshore, huh? She didn't answer. But I got a glimpse of her, reflected in one of those polychrome mirrors. It was streaked, though not enough to spoil the view. Her makeup was redder than ever against that white face, and her mouth was too thin to look kissable anymore. Monica was waiting for something to happen, and it wasn't all in the bag. She was worried. Mind if I sit down? I asked. I began to see a way out. It was that look from the corner of her eyes, toward the window that faced the filling station. She was trying not to let watching what I was doing split her attention. Stay where you are, she snapped. Look here, if you're going to plug me and make a good story, you better drill my chest and not my back. And don't forget to muss up your hair a little. She sniffed. A burglar's a burglar, even with his back turned. Listen, baby, I got flat feet. My dogs are killing me. How about sitting down or at least shifting my weight? Say, what's wrong with Brian, and what are you interested in him for? The dirty thief, she cut short. So your feet are tired? Try walking a little. Go slowly to the hall. She prodded me across the room. We went down the hall. When we got to her bedroom, I didn't have a chance to look around. 
all I could see was that the rug was torn, and the dresser had old cigarette bums on it, and there were a lot of clothes in the closet. Inside. Monica had an expressive way of jabbing with a pistol. Way inside to the end. There wasn't a chance of turning. I walked until a lot of sweet-smelling clothes surrounded me. Suddenly the bar that the hangers were hung on flopped loose, and Monica's wardrobe half smothered me. Before I could tear all that chiffon and stuff off me, she'd slammed the door and locked it. I heard her pushing the dresser against the door just to make sure. Now stay quiet, she said. I didn't make any moves until I heard her winding up that green car in the garage. Then I began giving that pastel hell, but there wasn't enough room for action. Some doors are easy to bust open, piece by piece, only this wasn't one of them. I guess the contractor made a mistake and put in a good one. It got so hot inside that I began to choke, and my shoulder was hurting. Finally I wadded up a bunch of her clothes and made a buffer. That helped me hammer the door, but still I was getting nowhere. I got up a heavy sweat, just from wondering how things were moving outside. When the panel began cracking, I did a Houdini. I got my feet braced so I could use my shoulder for shoving. That didn't do a bit of good for a while. Then everything let go, including the dresser in front. This was no time to phone the cops. I was sure of that the minute I broke loose. Before I got within jumping distance of the station, my hunch worked out in a large way. Things were happening. What they meant, though, I didn't have the slightest idea. Two guys were grappling near the gas pumps. One of them was big and lean. He wore overalls and had a beard that was dark and shaggy, hiding his face almost up to the cheekbones. The other fellow was Zahn and he was getting the worst of it. I quit wondering where Brian was when the shaggy man shook Zahn loose. Neither had heard me pounding through the sand. He socked Zahn a honey. The slick guy went limp and smashed against the ethyl pump. For a second he hung there, then slowly crumpled up. The shaggy man dusted his hands, grinned, and made a dive for the brown leather briefcase that lay on the crushed rock. The boys had been kicking it around during the scuffle. One of the straps had come loose. With the lights I'd left on, down below, it was easy to see. I made a dive for the bearded man. Drop it, mug. He was no slouch. He didn't break that scooping motion at all. I was ready to knock him cross-eyed, even if huge shoulders did fill that flannel shirt. But he just heaved the briefcase and smacked me in the face. The loose strap flicked my eye. For a split second I couldn't see. So my swing missed just enough for me to rasp my knuckles on his beard. It was like a horse's tail. He nearly took my head off. I knew he didn't have a hammer in his hands, so it must have been his fist. I guess I could have pulled my gun but I didn't like shooting after that hail business. Anyway, this gent seemed to enjoy using his dukes. I clinched long enough to clear my head and then I handed him a nice one. He slammed against the wall, and some stucco cracked off. Then I saw more of the briefcase that had socked me. Cigar coupons weren't poking out from under the flap. They were bonds or stock certificates, a bale of them. Zahn lay on his face, shaking all over. His bloody hands clawed the crushed rock, and his face was like hamburger. He was making funny sounds, as if his mouth were too small for his tongue. I saw all this while I took a jump for the bearded man. He yelled something, and then we tangled. After taking care of Zahn, he should have been winded but he was tough. We tripped and hit the crushed rock drive. That cut the shoulders out of my coat. I heard a woman screech. The bearded guy hollered. Letting go with one hand, he looked like he was flagging the girl to check out. That gave me a chance to shift around and crack his head against the gas pump. It didn't hurt him enough to notice. He cut loose with his knee, but I was moving, and the wallop caught my, Hest. That pried us far enough apart for a fresh start. I was dizzy now, and if the woman was still shrieking, I didn't hear her. The bearded guy got to his feet. I was on my knees, losing time. So I made a dive and tackled him. He crashed down, and a couple minutes more, or maybe it was hours, settled him. When I got to my feet and could stand without grabbing a gas pump, I saw that Zahn was sitting up and feeling his face. Where the hell have you been? He croaked. Where have you been? Taking gas to a woman's car. I just came back. What happened? Who's this guy here? He killed Brian. Zahn wiped his bleeding mouth. Brained him and knocked me silly. I heard them battling and came downstairs and tried to stop him. Get a rope or a wire before this Tarzan snaps out of it. I stood by, ready to boot him down if he made a quick comeback, but Zahn was fast enough. Then I began to wonder about the briefcase and the woman. Both were gone, and I heard an engine winding up, down the crossroad. With my head whirling, 
I couldn't be sure but I was willing to bet it was Monica and her convertible. There was no sense trying to chase her. I couldn't catch that bus with any of the three around the filling station. I wasn't even sure whether she was heading for the Matanzas Bridge or toward St. Augustine. So I went to see the corpse. Chapter 5 Zahn was sober but he smelled like a liquor warehouse that had been hit by a bomb. He was plain soaked with rye. Without staggering, though, he led me to the foot of the stairs that came down from the kitchen, in back, where there was a walk made of coquina blocks. Toward the other end, I saw Brian lying under the steps. He was gripping that big butcher knife from the kitchen. A flashlight was still glowing under him. He had flopped across it. There was enough reflection from the stucco to show me that his skull had been smashed practically in half. He was twitching and making choked sounds. How he did it, I don't know, with his face sunk in the sand. The tire iron had done a real job of murder. There wasn't any use moving him or trying to do anything for him. That was the sickening thing about it. I was glad when he stopped twitching and choking. He had been handed two socks across the head, and either one would have been plenty. T. And I saw why the knife was there. He had been prying up one of the coquina blocks of the walk. It lay to one side, and underneath it was the print of a briefcase. The only footprints I could see were a couple of skidded ones, and the twisting wind was swiftly driving sand into them. All I heard for a second was Zahn's heavy breathing. He was still winded, almost as badly as I was, and getting a little dizzy. Where were you? I demanded. Upstairs in my room. I felt rotten. Then I heard the riot below. I looked out of the window and saw the bearded guy smack Brian. He would have got away if I hadn't come downstairs. Did you see a woman around? When? Hell, I had my hands full. He looked like he had. I tried another tack. How about the briefcase? I rapped out. What briefcase? The one Brian had stashed under the coquina block. You and Harry Face were kicking it around when I came along. I didn't notice it. The hell you didn't. Listen, guy, you haven't been anywhere yet. You mean you didn't know Brian had some dough around here? Zahn's grin was painful. Sure, I knew. That's what we came here to see him about. But we didn't know where he kept it. What was it for? Zahn sat down weakly on the bench. He owed us some dough because of gambling on the cuff back in Tulsa. He ran out. Hale and I followed him. We own the happy hour club and we couldn't afford to lose 60 grand that way. We came out here when his girlfriend told us about this last stop service station. And he promised to pay off tonight? He said he had it buried somewhere else. He began promising us that tomorrow he'd fix us up. So far, it was straight enough. But I was wondering about the bearded guy and Monica. I asked Zahn about him. Another wise guy, playing tramp and looking for a cut, he explained. That Jane must be the front for the tramp. He had poor Brian scared. Brian, hell. What was his real name? It'll come out, sooner or later, now that he's dead. Oh, all right, Ryerson, then. I don't know who the tramp is or anything, except he beamed Ryerson. He went with me to Monica's house when I wanted to phone. The place was dark. If I hadn't busted out of the closet, she and the bearded gent would have made a clean walkout. He'd shave, and there'd be no description of her until someone found me. Having a prisoner wasn't any satisfaction. Zahn chuckled when I hung up, after telling the cops the whole score. Two corpses, one prisoner. Buck up, gumbo, he said. After all, you haven't lost 60 G's because someone beamed a guy before you could collect. Let's look the place over and figure out where the woman went. This mess left me with a couple of things to think about. Having my client knocked off made a monkey of me. Then I was wondering how the cops would look at my party with the late Mr. Hale. But I didn't have time to worry, I was too busy digging into Zahn. I ended by wiring my prisoner to a chair while I went upstairs to look around. A suitcase was packed. He didn't want to see the cops and he was checking out, Zahn said. I was pretty drunk and sick. But when I heard a noise in back, I looked out my window. I saw that Ryerson had a knife and a flashlight and was digging. That made me wonder if he was going to pay and run or just run. Before I could holler, the tramp with the beard came up and slugged him. He never had a chance. So you ran down to head off the killer? That's right. Sick and drunk but you got going, anyway? Zahn grinned. What would you do for 60 grand? Hell, I don't know. But there were a couple things I did know, though I wasn't telling him. Suppose you go to your room and wait. Don't mess around with anything in Ryerson's room. I want to talk to the guy with the beard. I followed him to his door. I couldn't tell whether he had been packing up or had just stopped unpacking. 
His suitcase was on a chair, full of stuff and wide open. You looked out that window? I pointed. Yes, that's the one. I went to it and stared down. Ryerson looked funny, huddled over the flashlight. At that distance, I couldn't see the shape his head was in. Too bad, I said. It would have been an easy shot from here. Zahn gave me a dirty look. If you hadn't taken my gap, I'd have done it. It would have been easy. I guess it was my fault, that I wasn't too sure, after all. So I went downstairs. When I asked the prisoner who he was, he politely told me his name was George Lake and he wasn't worried about a thing. He wasn't surprised when I said Ryerson had been bumped off. I didn't do it, he said. It must have been Zahn. So you know the boys? I blurted. His mouth twisted and his beard twitched. His eyes got so narrow they looked like blue murder. Rather. He answered. How does that Del Rio woman fit into this? I never heard of her, he said it flat and level. Don't be like that, I said. She snitched the briefcase stuffed full of bonds while you and I were mixing it. I wasn't too dizzy to hear and see. That's her business, Lake retorted from behind all that wire beard. It's her money. Ryerson stole it, and I helped her reclaim it. If you want her as a material witness, you have my sympathy. Try to bring her back too. Anything I say can be used against me, and I don't give a damn. You know the answers. I ought to. I'm a lawyer. That is, I used to be. He had courage, all right, guts, not bluster. With a murder rap hanging over him, he was positively cheerful. You like Monica Del Rio? Plenty, Lake admitted. But what is that to you? Ryerson was my client. If you killed him, and it looks like you did, you're my meat if it takes till judgment day. If you didn't, I'm all for you. You're not boosting Zahn? He asked suspiciously. I wasn't working for him. But look here, Lake. I stuffed a cigarette into his mouth. Monica is a long way from home. If Zahn found Ryerson, he can find her. You won't be on deck to look out for her anymore, he laughed in my face. No good, Gumbo. You want to find Monica and that briefcase. So did Hale and Zahn. Oh, all right. Let's hear your story. I like stories. Lake grinned. He was the happiest guy I ever saw wired to a chair. I was waiting for Ryerson and Zahn to run out, once you had shot Hale, he began. I was sure they'd want to leave before the police arrived. Investigation might have exposed the hidden bonds, negotiable paper that passes on delivery. It's like cash, you know. Yeah, I know, only I never owned any. You heard me give it to Hale? Lake grinned. Mister, I saw it and liked it. I was squatting in that garage at the time. Yes, I was intimidating Ryerson with air gun shots to make him run out so I could nail him with the loot in his hands. But I didn't kill him. You know I could have any time before you came here and nearly any time after. It would have been easy. I admire nerve, and Lake had plenty. He was talking now the way he wouldn't later. Battered, tired, and a big job just finished, he was considerably shaken. Who wouldn't have been? So you beamed Ryerson? You were sore, thinking of living in the dunes for weeks. Don't be stupid, Gumbo. While I was waiting, a man came out of the office. He looped around the vacant store and raced toward the rear. I didn't hear any voices or wrangling. A minute later, a man came back. It was Zahn. I tackled him as he headed for the car that was farthest from Ryerson's. Then you came up, damn your hide, as I was pounding Zahn silly. I'd seen Ryerson, through a window, packing a suitcase. Therefore, I knew the loot would be dug up. But the man I tangled with was Zahn, and he was carrying a briefcase. The idea was to have Monica run away with it while I toyed with you. I didn't know you were a detective. You know now, and getting KO'd isn't my idea of toying. You're on the spot, pal. Monica needs a lift. Well, do we play ball? He laughed in my face again. I was beginning to get tired of it. I still don't know a thing about you. Oh, is that it? Weren't you the guy who pried the phone off the wall? Yes, I did that. Why? So you couldn't call the police after you settled Hale. I wanted you to go to Monica's to call them, figuring on having you kept there. That would make the odds against me a little better, only Zahn and Ryerson, and both ready to run out. That sounded right, but there was a catch. If you thought I was a mug and not a legitimate detective, why'd you think I'd want a phone? I asked him. I was playing every chance. If you hadn't wanted to call, she'd have got you into the house some other way. Now what? So you're asking me things, huh? All right. Suppose you ask me what weapon killed Ryerson. Well, what did kill him? It wasn't a gun, or I'd have heard it. Ask Zahn. 
He knows. That tie iron you used to jimmy the phone, I shot out. It'll have your fingerprints. He made a good job of spitting, considering that his mouth was bruised. You'll wipe them off if I tell you about Monica? He grinned. There wasn't anything more to do with that guy. Between him and Zahn, one of them had cooled Ryerson. Each accused the other, and it was up to me to figure which was the one. I had a hunch, but it would take plenty of proving. What made the job even lousier was that the cops might pick the wrong guy. Then what chance would I stand? Chapter 6 For a while, things began unreeling. The sheriff, a long, hatched-faced fellow, came out with a couple of city detectives from St. Augustine, which is the St. Gumbo County seat. One of them was a tall guy named Castro and he looked a little like Zahn used to, before he got his face lifted, smooth, darkish, and with sleek hair. The other was a guy with an undershot jaw and eyebrows like nail brushes. He was stocky, and his puss was square and tough. It was Sheriff Haley who worried me, though. He just stood there, teetering on the balls of his feet and sucking his pipe and saying nothing. He let Castro do all the looking, and the other fellow, O'Toole, did the tobacco chewing. T. Hen there was a second carload of fellows with cameras and fingerprint stuff. A nice time was had by all, except the two stiffs and the prisoner. I didn't brain Ryerson, was all Lake would say. He was a skunk, and I would have beaten him silly. I wouldn't have used a weapon. It wasn't my party for the moment. I was busy because the sheriff went out to see Hale, who was still lying there in the sand. So you let him have it, huh? He asked grimly. What would you have done, sheriff? If I was a shooting person, wouldn't I have let that bearded guy have it instead of taking this beating? Hell, he nearly killed me. The sheriff nodded. Yeah. Lake did nearly do that. He fumbled with his droopy mustache and jerked his thumb back toward the filling station at the prisoner. He sure did give you hell. Only Zahn says you hated Hale's guts. He did, huh? I was losing patience. You saw that dummy. These two guys came to squeeze dough out of Ryerson. I was working for Ryerson and that's why I was in the way. You could have thrown something, Sheriff Haley said stubbornly. If I took a shot at you, what would you throw? A slug? Sure, he agreed. I would. But he was shooting at a dummy. That's different. I tried to draw him a picture that would be real simple. It was his second shot that made me give it to him, I said, like talking to a kid. Oh, I guess I forgot that, he admitted. Do you want to pinch me or leave it to the DA to decide? Well, you're a private detective. If I don't pinch you, you'll be messing around, getting in people's way. I guess I ought to pinch you. The sheriff was a practical fellow. He ended by figuring there was no use doing anything until he'd seen the DA. That was his general method, anyhow, doing nothing and letting Castro and O'Toole and the fingerprint man handle the job. When I finally headed for town, I was wondering how I stood on this business of plugging Hale. I didn't like Zahn's face. He probably couldn't twist the story enough to keep me in a jam but he might get me into one for a while. It might be enough to get me indicted, say, or jugged until the DA got wise. Why should Zahn try that? Well, I was pretty sure he'd killed Ryerson. He wanted me discredited as a witness, which would leave him and his story the main prop of the case. That way, he'd not only be free of suspicion, but he'd have a chance to find Monica Del Rio and the bundle of dough. One thing was lucky. He couldn't change his story to make me the guy who had brained Ryerson. But discrediting me, you know what happens to a guy and his testimony, once he's been under suspicion, would be a worthwhile move. Like I said, I was sure that between Zahn and Lake, Zahn was the one who had cooled Ryerson. But that would take lots of proving. At first, Zahn didn't know I was locked in a closet, so he was fussed up. Once he learned where I'd been, he got real bright and cheery, and a gent who's lost 60 grand hasn't any business cheering up. It was lucky that my pal at the agency went to bat for me. He knew the right people. The sheriff softened a bit, and I ended up at the little hotel near Fort Marion overlooking the bridge of Lyons and Volano Beach and the breakwater. There was a radio in the room. I turned it on, being tired but not sleepy. The air was crowded with police calls. They wanted the highway patrols to look for a green convertible, with a black-haired woman, supposed to be heading for Georgia. Any other way out of would take too long. Someone would pick her up. I wondered if she'd be foxy enough to take that risk and beat it, just by doing the unreasonable thing. I was beginning to nod when my phone rang. It was Monica, all breathless. You're not mad at me, are you? She asked. I ought to be after that rotten trick, I grumbled. She laughed. If I'd known, if Uncle George had known, who you were, 
everything would have been different. I listened to the news flashes. Say, where are you? A couple of blocks away. She gave me the name of the place. Why should I run out? As soon as I had time to think it over, I called on the police and turned over the briefcase. Evidence, you know. But the highway patrols are looking for you. They were, she corrected. You're way behind the times, and so is the radio. I want you to help me clear Uncle George. Getting George Lake out of that jam began to sound already like a tough job. According to the news dispatches on the air, his fingerprints were the only ones on the blunt instrument. Lady, am I a magician? I said to Monica. It'll cost you plenty, so why pick on me? You were there. You saw them all, just before it happened. I don't care what it costs. Come over right away, won't you? What else could I do? Among other things, I needed cash badly, and someone had made a monkey of me by knocking off my client. In a way, though, I didn't want the case. Supposing I ended by proving that George Lake had cooled Ryerson? But I went over to see her. I wanted to, anyhow. Monica's hotel wasn't far from Bay Street. There was no lounge private enough, so I planted myself in a deep chair in her room. She put up a brave front, but her eyes were desperate. They got under my skin. What's the score? I let off. Now that you know who I am, tell me. Ryerson was my uncle's law partner, back in Tulsa. He embezzled all the securities from my mother's estate. You see, Uncle George was executor without bond. He hadn't got permission from the administrator to turn the securities over to me, about a hundred and ten thou sand and negotiable paper. Let's get something else straight. You gave me just the room number, not your registered name. Who are you, anyway? The name is Lake, like my uncle's. Del Rio was camouflage. This embezzlement happened while I was in the East, at school. Ryerson had never seen me, so I furnished a front for Uncle George. Ryerson left him holding the bag? She nodded. He gambled a lot, though we didn't know it then. When it was discovered, the securities were missing from the partnership deposit box, the probate judge lifted the roof. Uncle George's story wasn't good enough to keep him out of jail. I did my best, but they sent him up. Naturally, the firm of Lake and Ryerson was finished. Everyone was sorry for poor Mr. Ryerson, who left town. Nothing could be proved against him, you see. So you picked up the trail from Kathleen, Ryerson's girlfriend? That's right, Monica answered. That was when she came from and began running around with a fellow named Hale. Kathleen Whalen didn't know me and she let a few things slip. So when Uncle George got out, I helped him by taking that cottage near the service station. He lived in the little cellar room he dug under the house. The idea was to intimidate Ryerson until he ran out with his loot. Then Uncle George was going to catch him. You see, my uncle couldn't prove Ryerson had the bonds until he caught him with them. An ex-convict's suspicions aren't well received. The reason I picked up the briefcase and ran was to avoid the chance of a slip. No matter what happened later, Uncle George's reputation would be clear. He wanted it that way. Only he ends up looking a murder rap in the eye. That shook her but only for a second. He'd rather be accused of killing a thief than if people think he had robbed me. She retorted. I could understand that. How about Hale and Zahn? I asked. Hale, I think, is the one who led Ryerson into gambling on credit, then 113 blackmailed him into stealing. When Ryerson did embezzle to save himself, he decided he might as well keep the loot and get a fresh start in life. That made sense. Like I said, Ryerson looked like a decent chap with just one weakness. After seeing his partner sent up on a bum rap, he got sore at himself and at Hale and Zahn. He didn't have nerve enough to confess and clear George Lake, so he ran out. T. Hen his girl crossed him, and the wolves tracked him too. What are you scowling about? She asked finally. Must you bite that cigar in half? I looked up and shook my head. Thinking always hurts me. When you said they blackmailed Ryerson into embezzlement, it gave me an idea. Every trick works two ways. What do you mean? She leaned forward eagerly and caught my arm. I'm not saying now. It's pretty thin, but the gag might work. It looks like the only chance, anyhow. If it wasn't for Uncle George's fingerprints on that tire iron, Zahn would be in the thick of it with him. Is it that bad? She blurted, white-faced. Fingerprints are hard to beat. But he didn't do it. Maybe he didn't, baby, but the cops have a case. Your uncle had a motive. He could have been sore enough to kill Ryerson. Do you think I'm a magician, making the police back down? I'm liable to make a chump of myself, like I've already done twice tonight. She had gorgeous eyes, and now they were full of tears. 
When she caught both my arms, her nails dug right in. You've got to help me. Can't you risk failure? Don't be so proud, you big gorilla. I'm sorry for you and your uncle. Honest, I am. But if I get on the job, I might find out he really had done it. If I do, it'll kill his last chance of making a defense. My client was knocked off, and I'm not pulling my punches. Would you like that? Her chin lifted. You can't scare me. Uncle George didn't do it. Okay, baby, you asked for it. I'm on the job. For a second she looked at me as if she were going to kiss me. And then, I'll be damned if she didn't. I walked out, trying not to breathe and figuring it would sure be hell if Lake really had cooled Ryerson. Chapter 7 The next morning, I had a session with the DA and got myself all squared about Hale. That part was easy. But when I told him he didn't have a snowball's chance against Lake, he flared up. He not only flared up, he sprang up and glared. You're crazy. It's plain larceny, taking Monica Lake's retainer. Look here. He threw me some enlarged fingerprint photos and the rest of the picture stuff. Lake handled that tire iron. He had the motive and the opportunity. We found that air gun of his. He admits he tried to drive Ryerson crazy. The rest of it is easy. Lake kept under control until he had the bonds and then he cracked. Why would Zahn do the job? You were away. Ryerson was packing up. The securities were dug up. According to your own story, Ryerson was too timid to fight back. That was a pretty good mouthful. There wasn't much I could say, so I just sat looking at the photos of the tire iron, the corpse, everything. I'd made the DA sore on purpose, and he'd bitten. Then to calm him down, I said. To hell with you. I'll handle the case free. I'm not blackmailing Monica Lake. I didn't tell him about the photos. The case looked a shade easier, though not enough to brag about. No amount of argument that Lake hadn't done it was worth a dime. I had to prove that Zahn had done it, which the photos wouldn't do. So I checked out and had a word with Lake's lawyer. He was a nice chap but a pessimist who had advised Lake to plead guilty to manslaughter or second degree. Then he'd put Monica on the stand. Murder for such a woman is seldom frowned on. Lake was stubborn as a pig, but I persuaded him to let his lawyer tell the reporters he was pleading guilty. That'd get on the air in time. I spent the afternoon out at the last stop service station. I walked up and down those creaking steps. I looked down from Ryerson's room, Zahn's room, the bathroom. I squatted in the grease of the garage. I ran back and forth, figuring how I'd go about conking a guy, squatting under the steps that led from the second floor. Finally I dug up the mate to the tire iron and practiced conking a fellow. If anyone had seen me, he'd have said I was nuts, but there was nothing but sandpipers and gulls around. Maybe I was nuts, anyway. At last, I laid the tire iron near the phone, checked up on the liquor supply and found it had been seized for evidence. It all came back to the blackmail which Hale and Zahn had used to make a thief of Ryerson. So I drove back to St. Augustine to do some blackmailing myself. First, I called Monica and told her to drive out, run her car into a cross drive, and hide in the sand dunes. Never mind the details, I said. Just watch the station and listen. Whatever you hear will be evidence, unless it's me being shot in the back. Then I went to see Zahn. I found him in the lobby of a flossy hotel, one with a two million dollar price tag on its souvenir postcards. St. Augustine has more big hotels per yard too than any other city on earth. Zahn had a good cigar in his face, and four more in his breast pocket. They reached up from the blue-edged handkerchief that went with the grey suit and red striped tie. His face wasn't quite fit for a screen test, but then neither was mine, after George Lake had worked us over. Zahn didn't lose the contented look when I barged in. He had no business being contented when he was out sixty grand he had almost collected. A dealer in hot paper would easily have given him that for Monica's legacy. I picked a Juan de Fuca from his pocket and threw my old cigar away. You got your nerve, you cheap mug, he said. So have you, looking so cool after losing the dough you and Hale figured on grabbing. You're wearing a contented cow look because George Lake is taking either rap. Otherwise, you'd have a face longer in the bridge with the lions at each end. What do you mean? He knew, but I told him. You slugged Ryerson. You crabbed a nice job I had. I'm broke, but you still got dough. You're the sole owner of the happy hour club, now that Hale's dead. What do you say we play ball? Wait a minute, fellow. Why should I want to play ball? Come on out to my car. We can talk better. He came along. I went into my dance before I touched the starter. It's this way, Zahn. The cops have muffed things. There's a lot that doesn't add up, out there at the last stop service station. 
Things happened too fast while I was hauling gas to Monica's stalled car. They happened so fast that you got a goofy story. If you hadn't, you'd be with the cops, sweating, instead of stalling here as a material witness against an innocent guy. What would you say happened? He came back. Well, you already had a hunch that Ryerson figured a run out, so you faked being drunk. Most of that liquor was spilled on your clothes from a bottle, not from your mouth. The bathroom didn't look right for anybody claiming he was sick. Your clothes didn't. So what? The cops aren't interested in my health. Go ahead and tell them, sap. That's because they don't think the way I do. I'm going out to make that place a genuine last stop for you, pal. It's gonna be your last stop, unless you suddenly get smart. What makes you think you can knock off my client and crab a nice job? Oh, putting the B on me, huh? Try it. I sat back against the cushions and laughed. Then I dug into my pocket and handed back the automatic I'd taken away from him. I don't believe in petty larceny. This is yours. I jerked the slide back and held the gat so he could see when I let go. A cartridge slipped into the chamber, out of the clip. My compliments. If you think you want to pay me with this instead of in cash, pick your time. He sat looking at the gat. He pumped out a shell and frowned. Then he looked up, satisfied the gun hadn't been tinkered with and that the action was okay. He hefted the cartridge he picked up from the floor. It weighed right, so he grinned a little. Been funny if you'd handed me blanks and claimed self-defense. Hell, I knew you'd look. Now, maybe you'd rather settle in cash, after all. Hale didn't have a chance gunning me, and neither do you. Honest gumbo, he guffawed, and winked. Listen, you rat, I was a square cop. That why they call you honest gumbo. I was really sore, getting a rib from him. Then I caught myself. All those dirty winks were coming in handy. Well, look here, Zahn. Lakes decided to plead guilty. Defending his niece's legacy and trying to square his own reputation will make it a bit easier. He'll claim Ryerson's knife and then he struck. What can I do? I ain't really selling Lake out. He just hasn't any guts. Where do I come in? Zahn was puzzled. No one can prove Lake didn't do it, I explained. Unless they prove that you did do it. The DA will drop Lake like a hot rock, but only if someone makes a case against you. And I'm the guy that'll do it, you rotten heel, unless you square up for the job I lost with Ryerson. You can't prove it. You're nuts. All right, I'm nuts. I don't want your dough unless you think I rate it. Five grand is the price, and a man should earn what he's asking. So before you pay off, I'm going to prove to you I'll really be earning five grand. Huh. Why'd Lake cop a plea? Because he's crazy about his niece. If he doesn't play ball, she'll be nailed as an accessory, hiding him before the crime and helping him get away. He got a fresh cigar, and I handed him my lighter. He was thinking. You really figure you can throw out a case like that? He asked finally. Brother, I've offered to prove it to you in private. I'm going to act out the crime the way you did it. When you see, you'll reach for your dough. And I can't cross you. If I did, I'd joke my head out of an accessory after the fact rap, concealing a criminal. Right? Yeah, you're right. He wasn't frowning anymore. He was that smooth, slick smile, except for the gauze and tape on his face. Show me. It was getting near dusk when we headed out over the bridge and past the ostrich and alligator farm at the north end of the island. It didn't take us long to cover the 15 miles to the last stop service station. When I got out of my bus, I knew it was going to be somebody's last stop, Zahn's, George Lake's, or mine. Zahn followed me into the office, and I pointed at the tire iron. Just like the one that killed Ryerson, I said. Except it hasn't got Lake's fingerprints on it. It's wiped clean. Zahn began rubbing his vest buttons, slow and languid. Now what? He breathed. That worried me. He'd made that same kind of move the last time he had tried to pull a gun on me. If he got ambitious when my back was turned, I wouldn't be clearing George Lake, and my reputation would make Zahn okay with the law. If I beat him to it, I'd be behind the eight ball. I couldn't make this case against a dead man. Then that hail business would sink me if I got Zahn before he began resisting arrest. Boy, I was sweating, and my stomach felt funny. I glanced around for a second, wondering if Monica was hit out of sight and yet was close enough to hear things. While we go upstairs, I'll explain, I said. I'll be Ryerson. You'll be yourself. And we'll imagine Lake is squatting in the garage. I like games, Zahn said, chuckling. Don't be afraid of handling that tire iron down there. You'll use a handkerchief the way you did when you hit Ryerson. He tightened a bit, then shrugged. The cops thought of that one, sap, he retorted. 
Okay, okay. Lake's greasy hands left prints that your handkerchief didn't blot. Transmission grease is like that. But don't worry about being framed by that iron. The original one is with the DA. Get going, he snapped, impatient now. All right. You're in that room, drunk. He went over the threshold into the room while I walked into Ryerson's room. I'm packing a suitcase, I called. You're not really drunk. You know he's trying to dig up that loot and run out before the cops get here. If Monica, you, Ryerson, and I get questioned about Hale, someone is going to spill about stolen securities. Then you'll be out of luck for keeps. Ryerson takes a rap. You both want to run out, and you know he's trying to do you another double cross. Mind reader, huh? Zahn sneered. That ain't worth five grand. I came out and went into the kitchen. I got a flashlight and a heavy knife, I said. Heavier than this little one I just picked up. I hear you snoring and mumbling. It fools me. I tried to get you drunk and I don't know you're faking. So I'm going down those creaky stairs to the back to dig under a paving block. All right. Are you doing it or just talking? I'm doing it. While I'm doing it, you'll see you are a damn liar. You cooked a fast story and it's lousy. If I hadn't nailed Lake, the cops would have grabbed you and you'd be sunk. But they're so happy about Lake, they didn't think about the cockeyed things. Such as what? He was polishing his vest buttons. But his eyes told me he was afraid to draw, even if I had both hands full with a flashlight and a knife. Put up or shut up. When Ryerson went down the back stairs, you knew what for. You couldn't sneak down after him, because the creaking would give you away. You didn't have your gap, so you ran down the front steps which are solid. At the phone, you picked up the tire iron and sneaked along the side of the building toward the back. Lake saw a man, and it wasn't I me nor the Sultan of Sulu. Nuts. The DA doesn't believe Lake. I do, Zahn. You needed a weapon because Ryerson had a big knife. You ran up behind him and beamed him. Then you came back the same way you went. When you headed for your car, Lake tackled you. No good, Zahn said but he licked his lips, and his eyes narrowed. I was in my room. I heard Lake mix with Ryerson. I watched it from my window. When I saw him drop the tire iron, I went down and tangled with him. You saw the fight. Chapter 8 It was easy to see what kind of mess I was trying to clear up. Each story sounded logical, and the brakes were against Lake. But I was ready for the payoff and praying Zahn would bite so that Monica would hear. I needed a witness to anything he'd say when I popped it to him. He let out a deep breath. My story seemed to have caused a bit of strain. He was itching to use his gun but he was afraid. There's one bad slip the DA will see when I talk to him, I said. Go down and grab that tire iron as if you were going to slug me when I squat over the bonds. See what kind of fingerprints you'd leave. Then use that iron like you were trying to pry a phone off the wall. Same whirls and loops but in a different position, because your fingers will be spreading from a different grip. What about it? He grated. Just this. The prints on the iron in the DA's office show that Lake couldn't have made them while smashing the phone. The DA never tumbled because he had the case in a bag. Is that worth five grand for me to shut up? You dirty, that slipped. He looked foolish, clenched his fists, then relaxed and smiled. You'd try to put the bee on me for that? It ain't worth a cent, I laughed right out, half turned to the door. You haven't heard the rest. Wait till I go into my act. I was talking over my shoulder as I headed for the stairs. You made one more slip that's an all-time high. It's as good as hanging yourself. What? His snarl nearly made me jump and draw. You said you were at your window, kind of leaning out and looking down, so you could see Lake cool off Ryerson. It all hangs on that. You saw him hit twice. Sure I did. Hell, don't I have eyes? Wasn't there a moon? I was almost to the ground now, and he'd come to the head of the steps. They creaked loudly under my weight. I still had my back turned, but I twisted my head a little to one side to watch him when I said. The window's open in your room, just like it was. I'm going to squat like Ryerson did. You poke your head out and see if you can watch me. From that window, you couldn't see him. The landing blocks the line of sight from up there. Huh. His jaw sagged, and his hands opened and closed. Yeah, you described the socking perfectly, only you couldn't see it from there. You could have from the bath but not from the one you pointed to. Is that worth five grand? It's worth that much to Lake. You, you damned liar. He yapped. I'm squatting. Go to the window and look. He said something, kind of choked, but I didn't answer. When he stumbled down the cross hall, his feet thumped like clods on a coffin in that empty house. I took the last couple of steps real slow, 
looking around intently for a glimpse of Monica. The stairs, in case I've forgotten to mention it, just came out from the landing but hugged the wall. You get the picture. One of the coquina slabs of the little patio was well under the overhang of the stairs. I squatted with my back to the window, the flashlight playing on the place where poor Ryerson had made his last stop. Zahn was thumping across the floor of his room. I could count the steps. They stopped. Maybe I lost count, but he must have been at the sill. I hoped Monica would not get hysterical and ruin it all. The payoff was hanging on exactly what Zahn did and said when he looked out to see if my story was worth five grand. He didn't say a thing. Suddenly a window jerked up with a smash. I had forgotten to tell him I'd lowered them all just a couple of inches too much for him to lean out easily. I stayed squatted, but it was tough waiting. I could feel the sweat running down my face. Maybe it was dumb, letting him have his gun, but I'd had to or he'd have been afraid to come out. Card sharps have a move they call. Forcing a card. You think you're selecting any card in the deck, but you actually have it pushed on you. You couldn't grab any but the planet one. No wonder the fellow can tell the spots on you, huh? Well, I did the same with Zahn, only I forced a window on him. He had spent a rotten half hour, thinking he wouldn't be able to see me. Naturally he couldn't from the window I. Forced. He'd said, offhand, that he was looking out of one of the two. When he pointed, everybody had let it go at that. Why wouldn't they? Nobody was making a point of exactly which window. A window is a window, isn't it? So there he was, above me. He was thinking about Lake's fingerprints, how they would crab the case and how that would make the D. A look for another suspect. I'd shaken Zahn on two plays. One was faked, the other real enough. He couldn't take it, and I was wondering whether I could. The window that was jerked up was the one through which he could see me too damned easily. He began firing while the sash was still rattling. He must have had his get out before he made a move. Just then, a woman screeched like a fire siren. It was Monica, getting nervous about me, I guess. That spoiled Zahn's shooting for a split second. A slug kicked up sand while I rolled away from the flashlight and wedged myself against the back of the bottom step. He was pouring lead and hollering, half crazy. You dirty heel. You think you can pull that? Splinters hit me. I couldn't risk letting him empty his gun, so I let him have it. He was too wild to have sense enough to duck or run. He was just killing mad. He jerked back over the sill, and his half-empty gun dropped to the sand. Before he could recover enough to run out, I dashed up and grabbed him. Zahn wasn't hurt bad. I had got him once, high in the chest near the shoulder. My other shot had gone wild and clipped some tape from his cheek. When a guy is pumping away at you, it isn't like target practice. Monica was out in the open now. She followed me, but I made her stay in the hall. I guess it made her sick when I picked Zahn up and slapped him down. I'll tear your head off. I snorted. Trying to plug me in the back, huh? Thought you could try that a second time, huh? He was bleeding like a stuck pig. I'll leave you here to drip dry if you don't cough up. You did it, didn't you? The unlucky mug had been running into one snag right after another and now he'd missed making this my last stop. He was half crazy. Sure I did. He screeched. Try to make it stick. I'd do the same for you. You. He'd heard Monica's yeep. That had probably saved my hide, because I couldn't turn around to face him until he'd opened fire. But he wasn't using his bean. Before he had sense enough to shut up, she had heard enough. When he realized she'd tuned in on the works, he nearly collapsed. So we hauled him to town. The way it turned out, it hadn't been absolutely necessary for me to give him a chance at my back. The position of Lake's hands when he used the tire iron to jimmy the phone got the DA off on a fresh start, and Uncle George walked out clean. Zahn's trying to hose my back with lead was what made his rap tougher. I heard later it was Zahn's last stop, and he got complete service. George Lake is back in Tulsa, practicing law without a partner. He's on top again, like he deserves to be. He's okay, even if he did nearly knock my head off. And every once in a while I get a postcard from Monica. Yeah, a postcard. If I were 10 years younger and didn't have a bald spot and red face like my uncle Charlie Bryan, maybe I'd have got more than a card. But what the hell, a guy can't have everything, can he? The end.